America's Cup teams were, were very lean. Our shore crew was exactly one person. And um, so we did all the work ourselves on the boat, including when the boat went in the shed for a major, for major surgery, which we did twice. Once we cut the boat it, literally in half and bent it up, it had a thing called a minimum displacement problem. It was in a minimum displacement penalty. And so that was the way to fix that. But that involved for us, the crew completely refairing and repainting the boat. And we did all that work ourselves in between rounds of racing to, to save money. We just didn't have the money. And then another time we had to replate the whole aft section of the boat called the bustle area. And same thing, a lot of long boarding and using something called fart rock to, to fare the boat. And I was kind of in charge of the bottom. That was my, I was a bottom specialist. And, um, so I was in there just sanding away. Uh, we would race, we raced a series and nine days off about eight of those nine days were in a shed with a dust mask on. And, you know, we didn't get paid a nickel and we loved it. We, we had our shirts, our t-shirts, and we would go down. Our pay was to be on the team and look good going down to the candy store at night and trying to fish some chicks out of the bar. And we, we built a, um, a, a radical boat, USA 61, had two rudders on the boat, one in the front and one in the back, and the keel was a, a T-keel, which was the first of its kind in those days. And so we built a mock-up of that on a soling. We took a soling and modified it to have that those design characteristics and raced it against a standard soling. Craig Healy would sail the standard soling, and I sailed the modified one. And we had a whole developmental program trying to understand how to race um, 61, you know, from six months before it was ever launched, which was great. I mean, that's the proper way to do it. And we, again, we didn't have a lot of money, but um, that was a project that I was, I am still proud of today. And, you know, all the way through, um, we were learning. I mean, I can remember the very first race down there, we couldn't hardly sail the thing. I mean, literally, it would tack sometimes when we didn't want it to. You know, Tom would, would get the, there were quite a few controls going on. We had an outer wheel, an inner wheel, and something called the collective and the cyclic. And, you know, we had a quadrant down below that had a track on it. And the, the arms that were coming from each of the rudders were sliding on the track while the quadrant was moving back and forth. And, you know, Tom was trying to get all this stuff lined up. And sometimes the thing would just get all crossed up. And I can remember the first couple of days, yeah, it was just, you know, all of a sudden the boat would start tacking and no one had been forewarned, you know, and we were all scrambling. Uh, but we got it together better and better and changed the sizing of the foils. And, um, you know, we beat Stars and Stripes two out of the three round robin races. And we, we were a credible um, third in the Louis Vuitton Cup. We did lose to Stars and Stripes in the semifinals and Stars and Stripes went on to easily beat everybody else and you know it was a it was a I don't know a childhood dream surreal thing for me because we raced five races during the big boat series there were 10 maxis 10 82 foot boats here Bill Coke Kilroy uh, Boomerang you know on Dean all the big names of maxi sailing at that time and we won every single race and five bullets and easily won the world championship and you know i can remember we were staying at the hyatt down there the hyatt uh, embarcadero and um because i didn't live here at that time i lived in san diego and um i can remember going to breakfast you know kind of maybe the second day and Ronald said you know paulino we, we should really think about doing the america's cup after this and i said oh raul america that's a bad idea i said you know it's really expensive only one guy wins. I mean, it's impossible to justify that time and that money. And, you know, he kind of, he kind of backed down a little bit. And then we went out and won the race again that day, you know, come back to breakfast the next day. Paulino, I really think we should do the America's Cup. And I said, Raul, that's a bad idea. You know, and I'm 29, I guess, or 28. And, um, then he says, and then we'd go out and win the race again that day. You know, now it's like the fourth day. Next morning, Paulino, we're doing the America's Cup. And that's it, you know. 
and we had a, a near fatal situation with one of the crew members. We had broken a lot of equipment on the boat, the poles, a few of the sails. The guys were tired and run down. And I thought the fastest way to the finish line was actually to sail slowly at that time. So we just rumbled along for 12 or 18 hours with just the mainsail up. That didn't require, you know, that way I could have just three, two or three people on deck, a lot of people resting, a few people working on repairing, and just let the whole thing calm down a little bit because I was on the edge of doing something catastrophic. And, you know, that's... Um, you have to swallow your pride a little. A few people passed us right there. But, you know, we lived for another day. And we got fourth on that leg, which turned out to to be maybe, you know, one of our worst legs. But we won the next leg. And then we won leg five. And, you know, then we really started. And we learned the most important things we learned from that leg. And we went when we went from New Zealand to Cape Horn, we put everything we learned to use. And we had a 140-mile lead at Cape Horn. And we, and we won that leg, you know, very easily. And at that point, after five legs, we'd won three of the five legs. So, yeah, I sailed for a whole night with no, with just the main up.